Hey my friends, welcome back to Kyle's Film Garage. I am in beautiful Thousand Oaks, California, and I have the pleasure and honor of interviewing my good friend John Nolan from Reanimator, among many other films. Truth be told, we have a long history together. We've worked on a lot of things together, part of companies and all that kind of stuff. So, super cool guy, and uh, just one of the geniuses of the film whole situation. So, uh, yeah, so let's get right into it. Hey, my friends. So this is John Nolan from Reanimator. Uh, we're good friends. We've been we've known each other for a bazillion years. So I just wanted to kind of have a, a casual talk with John and, and you all about film. So, so who, who are you, John? <laughs> uh, I, I guess I'm that guy in the mirror every morning. You know, um, and he's getting really old. <laughs> I don't know. I, I you look still, great, man. You look you great. Know, I, I still feel, I, I still feel the same as I did as a teenager, you know, in here, yeah, and the imagination and uh, and the storytelling and all of that uh, is kind of just still part of who I am. But um, you know, but like I said, the mirror. The, <laughs> I wish I wish I had that 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 that, that uh, picture on the wall that got old while I didn't. But uh, oh oh yeah. Um, uh, Dorian Gray. Dorian Gray. Yeah. 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 No, I, I hear you. I think we all we all want that. Yeah. Um, so how how did you get started in film? I grew up in a family of Germans from my dad's side mm -hmm. um, and a family uh, that was primarily English Irish on my mom's side. So if we didn't entertain each other we would probably kill each other. I mean, right, know, right. I, it was like, it was like, you know, from a, from a genetic standpoint, it's like I'm a world war, you know? So, uh, uh everybody kind of, I, I grew up with a generation of storytellers and, uh, my dad had worked in the, with the Northwest service command in the military, uh, building the, building the road through the wilderness, uh, uh, that is now the Alaskan highway. Uh, and wow. against impossible odds and, and all of that. And people are going, well, yeah, weren't there people dying? I said, yes, there were, but there was also, uh, there were also Japanese airfields in the Northern islands. And a lot of people don't realize that Japan extends into, into the Arctic. And, uh, you could go from those, from those islands into attacking, um, America, I mean, basically through Alaska and, and do it very easily. And we had absolutely no other route than than by ocean, you know, to, to get up there. So they built a road and they had to be able to build a road to be able to to get supplies and stuff up there. So um, that was a, was one of the one of the biggest early projects of the war. So it's kind of it's kind of it's known as the hidden the hidden war. So so my dad grew up telling us stories about it. I grew up with him telling all the stories about going from being in the horse cavalry to, to working with the Inuits and the natives up there and doing all kinds of stuff. And um, <clears throat> uh, my grandpa was Piccolo Pete, you know, uh, so my, my grandpa on my mom's side was a, uh, was the very, his, his radio show, the Piccolo Pete Hour, was the very first um, NBC broadcast uh, test show. Uh, it was the broadcast between Cleveland and New York and Philadelphia, and it was the test of the the very first network. So the first radio show ever shown more than locally, or ever, ever played more than locally. Piccolo Pete. Yeah, that is awesome. And, you know, he came out of vaudeville. He also came out of minstrel shows and all of that sort of stuff. 
Uh, he had been Al Jolson's partner for many years, but he and Al Jolson did not uh, believe the same things at all. Oh. Right, right. Al, Al Jolson turned out to be... Uh, uh, beep, beep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excise this entire part of the video, yeah. <laughs> No, that's fine. Believe it. A lot, lot, of, lot of bigotry and stuff like that. So yeah, you know, my, my grandfather walked away from him, and uh, but he did make friends with one of the um, uh, one of the comics, who was known as Buckeye Bob Hope, and so on uh, on on the very first link up of NBC, uh, the very first comic to ever be on there was Bob Hope, which is why they called him Mister Radio, and you know he's known as the history of my grandfather who died of multiple sclerosis at age 39, basically, you know, faded. Wow. But I grew up around the history of it. So I inherited his makeup kit. And I inherited, you know, so it's like, um, I figured So well, it's, it's definitely, it's in the blood. Yeah, it's in the blood. I got a makeup kit. I'm in theater. Um, I've got a good voice. My dad ended up uh, after some not so great things business-wise, ended up working with a membership department store thing called Jemco, which was owned by Lucky's. And he ended up with a, he bought this stereo system that had uh, a four track reel to reel recorder in it with a, uh, you know, with all the mixers and all of that stuff. So I started making my own little radio broadcasts at home. I started doing voiceover work. I started doing impressions. Um, I ended up being, uh, Rich Little hired me to be on his first episode of his, of the Rich Little show. Um, and I bumped into him at the Arizona State Fair with my wife. And so, you know, I mean, I just kind of, I grew out of, uh, getting involved in theater and getting involved in radio, being an intern at KPHO, uh, uh Channel 5 television in Phoenix and, and kind of evolved up into, um, on our honeymoon, we went to Universal Studios while we were over, over here from Phoenix, and uh, uh, we went to the makeup show there, the old Land of a Thousand Faces. Cool. And after the show, we walked through a door just to avoid the crowd that turned out it led into a shop and a, uh, a studio lab area. And I walked into that shop, and it was like deja vu. It was like I... I, I had dreamed about it. I had lived there. I don't know. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. It was like it's I just knew, like you feel like in your element. Like I, I, I knew. Know this. I, I knew it was part of my future. So when we moved out here later that year, um, I got a job in the land. You know, land of a thousand faces in the shop to start with, and then eventually as a supervisor. But uh, I got a I got a job there, and I started uh, making friends with the lab guys. And one of them introduced me to a guy named Johnny Gone, who at the time, again, a name you'd never heard of because he didn't want you to hear it. <laughs> he built the magic illusions. He built the biggest magic illusions in the world. Wow. And I, at that time, was playing around with early materials, um, uh, versions of foam latex and versions of silicone for reproduction of certain human uh, human elements and body parts and things like that. And um, so I made friends with John and whenever he needed a replacement body part to, to show or to pop up in a magic illusion, I would make that for him. And that led to me working with Orson Welles uh, at the, in the Orson Welles uh, Live from the Magic Castle, his, his last his last big uh, TV broadcast. And uh, uh, it led to me working with Doug Henning. Uh, it led to me working uh, with Doug Henning on Broadway. It led to, I, I went to Don Post Studios and I became head of their special projects and I took all that magic work over there. And we so were what's working. Don Post Studios? Don Post Studios, Don Post Sr. had invented uh, or co-invented slush casting latex, which is basically to take a negative mold, you put latex rubber in there, which is a um, gum rubber mixed with certain clays to make it stronger. Um, and uh, basically latex gloves, all of that. Okay, so that's latex. And in the 30s, he realized that 
you didn't need a cord mold, a, a mold with an interior to it. If you poured latex in to a mold that had gypsum in it, like plaster, uh, there would be a chemical exchange, uh, just kind of the kind of like the the milkshake lining the inside of the glass. Basically, when you poured that back out, it would leave a layer which would dry and form a mask. And uh, uh, the masks that were um, that were used for the uh, FBI recreations for the Brinks job uh, that was one of the one of the uh, projects that they did for the you know, that they did at Don Post Sr. Uh, he did uh, a lot of stuff during World War II. Um, for D-Day, you know, they had uh, parachute, paratroopers, you know. Gonna, so the idea was to keep people from uh, actually shooting the paratroopers, we'll put three times as many paratroopers in the air as there are paratroopers, and we'll make them out of rubber, and we'll make them in miniature, but perfect scale miniature. So you also can't tell exactly where they are. So that's um, brilliant. They threw thousands of those out, and they were coming down by the thousands, and uh, and people were shooting uh, at at rubber dummies that were also the wrong size. So they're aiming in the wrong places, which made them very unconfident in their aiming. Period. Wow. So um, uh, that was a big thing for D-Day. Uh, they also made paper bags that were lined with rubber uh, that they uh, used to put uh, large pieces of, uh, of ordnance, rolling, rolling ordnance like tanks and uh, personnel carriers and stuff like that on. Uh, they, they, they put them in these big bags, they sealed them, and they put them on the, on the ships on pallets uh, so that uh, they would uh, they would not rust on their way across the ocean. Okay, so and like moisture barriers. What the moisture barriers, became. right? And uh, then they realized they could also for um, uh, the the secret. I, I don't know if you've heard of the of the Ghost Army, but the Ghost Army was a kind of a kind of a very interesting secret project the government was involved in, and uh, it basically meant using fakes, using, uh, you know, which they started using for targeting practice. And then they realized, you know, it's really hard to tell, especially aerial photography and stuff like that. These look real. Mm -hmm. So we could actually make it look like we've got 50 tanks instead of 12 tanks. Plus, again, there's the diversion. If you shoot one of the fake tanks, you're not shooting a real tank. So, um, uh, but, uh, in the Battle of the Bulge, there was they literally used elements of the Ghost Army to make it look like their um, their reinforcements had not arrived yet. Uh, and so this kind of is this is all like um, and, the the Post Studio, like yeah, was, Don Post Don did Post. a lot of that sort of stuff. As uh, you know, and he got involved with John Chambers, and they did all kinds of special projects for the industry, and they also made masks that they sold to the public. Hey, my friends, thank you so much for checking out this video with John Nolan. I had a great time doing it. Remember to please click like on this, share this with all of your movie fans and whatnot, because I know that people want to see this video. So share it, subscribe to the channel, join the channel for two bucks for the, uh, at the uh, buy me a coffee stage phase. Much appreciated. Keeps us going. And uh, so, yeah. I will see you on part two of the John Nolan series. It's going to be a three-part series of the interview with John Nolan from Reanimator. So thank you so much, and I'll see you on the next video.